Hey, sometimes at work, I come across cool hardware or unusual IT problems. So I thought it would make a good material for vlogs. This time, I had to virtualize this 20-year-old server. This Dell has been in production for a long time, and its hardware well reflects that. The case is very heavy, and with right screws it can be fitted into a rack. Sadly, that configuration makes CD-ROM unusable. I was surprised that basic disassembly can be done with practically no tools. What's even more amazing, I think you can still get the support for this server from official Dell webpage, and I've seen replacement motherboards available for around 250 US dollars. Now, the hard drives are something I have never seen before. They have physical SCSI interface, which looks like AT pin SCA, though I'm not sure. The connector has been deprecated for quite some time now, but the SCSI protocol itself is still widely used today. The data on that server still has some historical value. It will be migrated and archived on some other proper database soon, but for now, I've been worried that after 20 years the hard drives might fail. And even though you might see the server boot into a login prompt now, it hasn't done so before. The server also uses Perl instead of PHP to render website contents. And since I have zero Perl experience, I really wanted to try and migrate the whole thing with as little interference as possible. With the server running 2.2 kernel, I pretty much knew that migrating to a simple virtual machine would be impossible. But to a container... At the moment, I have no login credentials to this server. But thankfully, it's not encrypted. Thus, I can try gaining access from live ISO. I'm using GRML ISO, which contains lots of useful tools for situations like this. I was a bit skeptical, but the drive properly read the CD and booted off of it. Live ISO is using minimal resources, but even with this minimal memory and CPU footprint, the system feels slow and sluggish. My main concern was that the modern Linux might not recognize the hard drives or the onboard SCSI controller. But thank the heavens, all the block devices and partitions are visible. Since I've done a little reconnaissance beforehand, I know this system has been split into three main partitions. Root, Home and USR. And swap, but that's not important. I need to mount all of them properly under slash MNT. With the base file system mounted, I can try to truth into it. Since this isn't a tutorial, let me just say that truth switches your top level directory, so the slash MNT is now seen as a root. Not only for the user, but for all the other programs too. It is the most basic form of a container. The programs are still using their respective libraries, but are launched on the host's kernel, in this case a pretty modern kernel version 6. The real test is to see whether the MySQL and HTTPD will launch properly while in truth. And while MySQL starts up ok, the HTTP fails. Let's check out the logs. Sorry for masking out the sensitive info, but the most important thing is that HTTPD configuration is weirdly done, and it's using names instead of IP addresses. This is an easy fix involving adding a line to etc hosts. No biggie. All in all, it's pretty promising. Since I can run everything in truth, it should also run within Docker. But before that, I still need to copy the disk contents. In this case, I am going to do a full block device copy using DD and SSH as my transport layer. By connecting my laptop directly to the server with an Ethernet cable, I can configure common IP subnet and just dump the drives as files. It's worth noting that block size parameter I'm specifying is only there to speed up DD, since by default it uses 512 bytes. Piping through PV is meant only to show me the status progress in a more human-friendly way. Back at my office desk, I've created a VM with Debian 12, installed Docker, and mounted previously copied disk images. Then, I'm mounting partitions under slash mnt again to have a working file system structure. The process of creating Docker image is pretty easy. With everything mounted properly, 
I'll need to package this slash mnt directory using tar and pipe the output to docker import command. The messages about ignoring sockets are to be expected. After it's done, we can check on our image using docker image ls. Unfortunately, it's over 6 gigs in size, but that's because it contains complete system and MySQL storage. I still need to start the container and somehow manage it. For that, I'm going to use my favorite Docker Compose systemd helper unit. Also, I forgot to mention, but even though our base system was 32-bit, the Docker handles those without any issues. It could be a whole different deal if it was an ARM system, but for now we're good. With everything in place, I only need to write a docker compose yaml file. Specifying the hostname option dynamically adds proper line in etc hostname. It has to be done this way since container IP can change. The startup command launches MySQL and HTTPD, and then the last part of that command avoids quitting the container by not returning the control, and waiting for the proper signal from Docker. Finally, we're exposing the HTTP port. I can't really show you the website, but I hope you found the process itself interesting. The 20-year-old software is running inside of a Docker container. If you made it this far, thank you for watching. Liking and subscribing would be greatly appreciated.